Hi folks, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of 2010 Odyssey 2 by Arthur C. Clarke. So this is a sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey. As usual, I'm going to um, check out the blurb, I'm going to read the blurb to you guys, I'm going to check out my tabs, uh, and then we'll give me my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I am currently about a third of the way in it, so it's going to be mini reading vlog style almost. Let's get to the blurb. Dane reads... 2001 A Space Odyssey was the greatest story ever written of man's destiny in outer space. Now, in 2010 Odyssey 2, the ultimate quest continues. Out among the moons of Jupiter, the empty spacecraft Discovery and the enigmatic alien monolith still float in the silent depths of space, mute witnesses of the mysterious disappearance of astronaut David Bowman through the Stargate nine years before. To them comes the Leonov, bearing a joint Soviet-American scientific team on a mission of investigation and recovery, a mission whose outcome will be on the wildest imaginings of any of the mere humans involved. 2010 Odyssey 2 carries the century's greatest story onward into astounding new dimensions of the imagination. It is a masterwork by one of the 20th century's greatest storytellers and thinkers. So, let's check out some tabs. We'll start with the author's note. Um, and I knew some of this already from the uh, author's note for 2001. So he says, The novel 2001 A Space Odyssey was written during the years 1964 to 68 and was published in July 1968, shortly after the release of the movie. As I have described in The Lost Worlds of 2001, both projects proceeded simultaneously, with feedback in each direction. Thus I often had the strange experience of revising the manuscript after viewing rushes based upon an earlier version of the story, a stimulating but rather expensive way of writing a novel. Yeah, few of us get that. That, uh, that that advantage there. And I love this as well. Um, so he writes, The date 20th of July 1969 was still half a decade in the future when Stanley Kubrick and I started thinking about the proverbial good science fiction movie, his phrase. Now history and fiction have become inextricably intertwined. The Apollo astronauts had already seen the film when they left for the moon. The crew of Apollo 8, who at Christmas 1968 became the first men ever to set eyes upon the lunar far side, told me that they had been tempted to radio back the discovery of a large black monolith. Alas, discretion prevailed. That would have been very funny though. Okay, so let's get into uh, the novel proper. And they talk about Dave Bowman's transmissions and they say right up to the last, my god it's full of stars. We've even done a stress analysis on his voice patterns. We don't think he was hallucinating. He was trying to describe what he actually saw. Interesting. We get a reference to Alan Turing, one of the gods of the computing pantheon. I'm a big fan of Alan Turing. I've read his uh, biography by Alan Hodges. And uh, we have like a cousin computer of Howell's um, called Sal. Um, and they're doing some work to investigate what went wrong with Hal. But interestingly, um, it goes, Will I dream? Of course you will. All intelligent creatures dream, but no one knows why. Mm, even the AI. Um, and we get a woman called Tanya, who she's had all of her hair cut off ready to go into space, and she says, Yes, I was sorry to lose it, but hair's a nuisance on long missions, and I like to keep the local barbers away as long as possible. And they find, um, in space, they find this, like, creature... Um, it was generally agreed that the creature encountered by Dr. Chang did not represent a high form of intelligence, at least if his interpretation of its behaviour was correct. No animal with even elementary powers of reasoning would have allowed itself to become a victim of its instincts, attracted like a moth to the candle until it risked destruction. Vasily Orlov was quick to give a counterexample that weakened if it did not refute that argument. Look at whales and dolphins, he said. We call them intelligent, but how often they kill themselves in mass strandings. That looks like a case where instinct overpowers reason. No need to go to the dolphins, interjected Max Brelovsky. One of the brightest engineers in my class was fatally attracted to a blonde in Kiev. When I heard of him last, he was working in a garage, and he'd won a gold medal for designing space stations. What a waste. Um, and then I want to read this bit out here. Uh, this is the start of chapter 14, Double Encounter. Uh, just some really interesting... Uh, talking about Victorian art. Uh, for the last couple of hours I've been recalling a picture I saw as a boy in a tattered volume of Victorian art. It must have been almost 150 years old. I can't remember whether it was black or white or colour, but I'll never forget the title. Don't laugh. It was called The Last Message Home. Our great-great-grandfathers loved that kind of sentimental melodrama. It shows the deck of a windjammer in a hurricane. The sails have been ripped away and the decks awash. In the background, the crew is struggling to save the ship. And in the foreground, a young sailor boy is writing a note, while beside him is the botley hopes will carry it to land. Even though I was a kid at the time, I felt he should have been giving his shipmates a hand, not writing letters. All the same, it moved me. I never thought that one day I'd be like that young sailor. And it is a good point, though. He should have been helping, really. It's a great line here. Chandra doesn't believe in alcohol. It makes you too human. And they're talking about Io, Jupiter's moon. 
and we get soon after we got here I realized that IO reminded me of something it took me a couple of days to work it out and then I had to check with mission archives because the ship's library couldn't help shame on it do you remember how I introduced you to the Lord of the Rings when we were kids back at that Oxford conference well IO is Mordor look at part three there's a passage about rivers of molten rock that wound their way until they cooled and lay like twisted dragon shapes vomited from the tormented earth that's a perfect description. How did Tolkien know a quarter century before anyone ever saw a picture of Io? Talk about nature imitating art. So we get this little line. Uh, Max, whatever happens, please don't go chasing off after the ship's cat. Um, and they turns out that they know there's a reference to it being screened. They're talking about the first Alien movie, uh, which I think is cool, but also it shows when this was written, because obviously the first uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey was before the moon landing in 69. This is after Alien, which was 79, so it's cool to see the differences. So I want to read this little bit out at uh, the start of the chapter called The View from Lagrange. Astronomy was full of such intriguing but meaningless coincidences. The most famous was the fact that from the Earth, both Sun and Moon have the same apparent diameter. Here at the L1 Liberation Point, which Big Brother had chosen for its cosmic balancing act on the gravitational tightrope between Jupiter and Io, a similar phenomenon occurred. Planet and satellite appeared exactly the same size. And what a size! Not the miserable half degree of Sun and Moon, but 40 times their diameter, 1600 times their area. The sight of either was enough to fill the mind with awe and wonder. Together, the spectacle was overwhelming. We get references to like tapeworms. Um, in the very old days, they really did use magnetic tape. And it's possible to construct a program that can be fed into a system to hunt down and destroy, eat if you like, any desired memories. Which I guess is similar to what we would just call a worm today. Um, and it says, can't you do the same thing to human beings by hypnosis? Yes, but it can always be reversed. We never really forget anything, we only think we do. A computer doesn't work that way. When it's told to erase something, it does. The information is completely erased. Well, actually, that's not true, because you see on, you know, crime shows and stuff, they can recon reconstruct hard drives and find data that's been deleted. They can undelete. So this little story here, I find just quite amusing. There was one bit of unscheduled activity the other day that will tell you something about our state of mind. The fire alarm went off in the middle of the night, triggered by one of the smoke detectors. Well, it turned out that Chandra had smuggled some of his lethal cigars aboard and couldn't resist temptation anymore. He was smoking one in the toilet like a guilty schoolboy. Of course, he was horribly embarrassed. Everyone else thought it hysterically funny after the initial panic. You know the way some perfectly trivial joke, which doesn't mean a thing to outsiders, can sweep through a group of otherwise intelligent people and reduce them to helpless laughter? One had only to pretend to light a cigar for the next few days and everybody would go to pieces. So we get a reference to these, uh, you know, the black um, obelisks that are around, that are in the ratio of 149 and we get how obvious now is that mathematical ratio of its sides the quadratic sequence 149 and how naive to imagine that the series ended there in only three dimensions very nice very nicely written that little bit so here we have some cool little stuff about Walt Disney. Uh, a fin de siècle philosopher had once remarked, and been roundly denounced for his pains, that Walter Elias Disney had contributed more to genuine human happiness than all the religious teachers in history. Now, half a century after the artist's death, his dreams were still proliferating across the Florida landscape. When it had opened in the early 1980s, his experimental prototype community of tomorrow had been a showcase for new technologies and modes of living. But as its founder had realised, Epcot would only fulfil its purpose when some of its vast acreage was a genuine living town, occupied by people who called it home. The process had taken the remainder of the century. Now the residential area had 20,000 inhabitants and had, inevitably, become popularly known as Disneyville. Yes, I know I have some reminders, Google. Great little quote. It must be wonderful to be 17 and to know everything. We get a reference to hydrogen under such enormous pressure that it become a metal, which I think is very cool. Um, and the, at the core of Jupiter, forever beyond human reach, is a diamond as big as the Earth. We get this line. I'm disappointed. I thought he was a little more mature. After all, he is 32. 31. Jesus, mate, I'm 34. I'm immature as they come. Ha, <laughs> come. A great quote uh, here, somebody quotes Haldane, he says, The universe is not only stranger than we imagine, but stranger than we can imagine. And we get uh, the, the saying, once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is a conspiracy. And I know, I know that via Ian Fleming's twist on it. Um, once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is enemy action. Tanya says something consolingly, which winds me up. I never like L-Y words, uh, adverbs. And um, Max and Ch uh, Chandra, Chandraski or whatever his name is, um, are talking about Hal and all of this stuff. And we get this, hell Chandra, he's only a machine. 
So are we all, Mr. Brelovsky. It is merely a matter of degree. Whether we are based on carbon or on silicon makes no fundamental difference. We should each be treated with appropriate respect. And we get um, these couple of paragraphs, which I thought were cool because obviously we live in the, you know, an age where this happens all the time, like the save icon is a floppy disk, you know. All systems functioning normally, said Hal, two minutes to ignition. Strange, thought Floyd, how terminology often survives long after the technology that gave it birth. Only chemical rockets were capable of ignition. Even if the hydrogen in a nuclear or plasma drive did come into contact with oxygen, it would be far too hot to burn. At such temperatures, all compounds were stripped back into their elements. His mind wondered, seeking other examples. People, particularly older ones, still spoke of putting film into a camera or gas into a car. Even the phrase cutting a tape was still sometimes heard in recording studios, though that embraced two generations of obsolete technologies. And yeah, I suppose it does, because after tapes we had CDs, and then after CDs we had MP3s. So we get a reference to uh, von Neumann machines, and Katerina says, and what is a von Neumann machine? Explain, please. Suppose you had a very big engineering job to do, Katerina, and I mean big, like strip mining the entire face of the moon. You could build millions of machines to do it, but that might take centuries. If you were clever enough, you'd make just one machine, but with the ability to reproduce itself from the raw materials around it. So you'd start a chain reaction, and in a very short time, you'd have bred enough machines to do the job in decades instead of millennia. With a sufficiently high rate of reproduction, you could do virtually anything in as short a period of time as you wished. The space agency's been toying with the idea for years. And he even says at the end of it that um, that it's, um, that there's like a scientific precedent for that. We get a reference to the uh, the word ahimsa. It's usually translated as non-violent, so it has more positive implications. Funnily enough, I heard about that at last year's vegan camp out and considered getting it tattooed, because um, I think it's a really nice concept. A lot of vegans uh, will think about this as a, a way in which they live, you know? And we, so Jupiter basically gets, gets bye-bye'd. Um, and they're asking like, why, why did they do it? A warning? Against what? We'll find that out later. I don't suppose that it was an accident. What a terrifying, what a terrifying idea, said Floyd, but I think we can rule it out. If that was the case, there'd have been no warning. Perhaps. If you start a forest fire because you've been careless, at least you do your best to warn everyone. So, and that's never really answered as well, which I think is very cool. And then right at the end of his acknowledgements, I just thought this was interesting, kind of dates it in a way as well, but it says, This book was written on an Archive 3 microcomputer and WordStar software and sent from Colombo to New York on one 5-inch diskette. Last minute corrections were transmitted through the Paducah Earth Station in the Indian Ocean Intel Sat 5, uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka, July 1981 to March 1982. So yeah, 2010 Odyssey 2. Funnily enough, I actually enjoyed this more than 2001 A Space Odyssey. I think part of that is because there's, you know, the world building's already been done and we can keep on building on top of that. Um, did enjoy it. It was a strong 3.5 out of 5 for me and I'm looking forward to Odyssey 3, which I have up there. So there you have it. That's what I made of 2010 Odyssey 2 by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.